Hi everyone. Yeah, this is uh, Eric Novak. I'm I head up the new product development at uh, 4D Technology, and uh, really happy to have you all attending today. I appreciate the time out of your schedules. Um, we're going to try and keep this as interactive as possible. Uh, most of the webinar will be uh, Kramer doing live measurements and us, you know, discussing what's going on with the system and uh, we'd love to be answering questions and uh, getting suggestions on additional things you'd like to see in terms of the measurements. Uh, but we're going to start off with just a few quick introductory slides before we get to that. So uh, without uh, further ado, uh, you know, the, the products we're talking about today um, are our 4D in-spec uh, line of uh, surface profilers. And uh, we'll give you a bit of introduction about 4D and uh, how these guys came to be. So, uh, yeah, so 4D technology, we're uh, a division of Onto Innovation, and uh, our division is based in uh, Tucson, Arizona. We do all of our uh, engineering, uh, production, uh, test, software development here in Tucson. Uh, we've been around for about 20 years now, um, a pretty technology, focused company uh, with uh, approaching 60 employees now. And uh, really our claim to fame has been vibration immune three-dimensional measurements. And uh, a few years back, we were approached by a major aviation company who said that they really needed shop floor uh, 3D capability. And the reason for that is they were using primarily a visual uh, inspection using hard gauges or comparison plates, as well as fingernail testing for assessing depth and severity of defects. Uh, they found that to be highly operator dependent, uh, of course, you know, non-gauge capable, uh, non-quantifiable. And because of that, they were actually rejecting and reworking literally millions of dollars a year of components at single locations. Uh, some of the locations were a little more sophisticated, and they had gone to using uh, replication, using repro rubber replicast, uh, which is the same material your dentist uses. Uh, that would make an impression of the feature trying to be measured. Uh, they would move that then onto a stylus profiler or an optical comparator. Uh, the issues there being, uh, you know, 30 or more minutes per measurement. Because it's fundamentally only giving 2D data, uh, they wouldn't know that they actually got the deepest part of the scratch or nick or other feature. And uh, both the material uh, could affect the results. Uh, did it go all the way down into the bottom? And the operator themselves in terms of how they cross-sectioned it, how they mounted it. Um, so an alternative was desired. Um, Looking around, you know, there are systems that are highly quantitative. Uh, they're uh, more than capable of, you know, doing high resolution measurements. Uh, those can be either optical systems or contact systems. But the problem there is they're quite expensive and they're not suitable for a lot of components. So large parts just can't be mounted under a microscope stand. So you're back to replication. Um, all the operators oftentimes needed to be highly trained people, and there's lots of knobs and buttons to tweak. And uh, feedback could be slow if it actually had to go into a metrology lab and out. That could be days to weeks, depending on what was going on at the sites. So, you know, these systems are in general expensive, difficult, and time consuming. And uh, therefore, you know, we, we work to try and make you know, a solution that's much easier. And that brings us, you know, to the 4D in-spec. Our goal with the, with the development was to create a product where taking a measurement is almost as easy as taking a picture with your cell phone, um, but that gives you rapid, quantified, three-dimensional results. So take the operator variability out of things, um, allow the metrology to go to the part, so you can see in the lower left of the image, uh, one of our applications engineers is actually measuring a defect inside of a large aerospace cowling. 
Uh, he's using our touchscreen interface uh, to uh, to assess the measurement. Uh, the system is portable. It can roll around on a shop floor using the cart, such as you see on the right. So the whole thought is, you know, bring the metrology to the part, let any operator do it, and you'll get better results. Uh, you know, true handheld operation was important for us. Uh, and that's where some of our intellectual property comes into play. We have some unique capability that will give 3D results in a single camera frame. And so you can hold it by hand. Uh, it can be placed in a machining center. It can be mounted on a robot. And because it's an optical technique, you can see here in the lower left and in, again, the lower center, we can actually use a fold mirror, much like the dental mirrors inspectors use visually, to fold the, the measurement beam sideways so we can look inside of fir trees, into shafts, underneath lips, and places without optical access. So, you know, very easy system, single Ethernet cable for power and data, um, just point and shoot. So I'll go over some basic specs, and then we'll go over some of the materials we, we look at, and then we'll start in, in with grammar on the live measurements. Uh, again, if you have questions along the way, you can type them into the questions box uh, in your interface. But, uh, you know, we have two models of system. Uh, the one on the left uh, is the 4D InSpec. Uh, that's our most popular model, really designed to get into small spaces. It has the highest resolution um, at uh, two and a half micrometers or a ten thousandth of an inch. Uh, can actually measure depths all the way up to two and a half millimeters or a tenth of an inch. And the standoff distance or the distance from the end of the instrument to the place where you're measuring is about uh, 35 millimeters. Uh, and the field of view is about eight by eight millimeters or a third of an inch. Its big brother is called the InSpec XL. It has nearly twice the field of view, a little less vertical resolution and uh, a much greater standoff distance, more than two inches. Uh, this is really designed for measuring large components, uh, maybe turbine blades, uh, fuselages, things like that. You don't sacrifice a lot of vertical resolution. Uh, it is a bigger product, so it's not so amenable to get into tight spaces. Um, it also isn't great uh, in terms of using fold mirrors for tight spaces but it does offer for measuring larger components, you know, four times the measurement area for, uh, for each snapshot. In terms of material, we were asked to uh, measure almost any material, and so that was our goal. So we've tested the unit and it's been deployed measuring carbon fiber, composites, uh, glass, plastics, cast iron, almost any material. The only thing that it will struggle sometimes with are semi-transparent surfaces, such as the top of a, a soda cup or something that's a little bit cloudy. That can destroy some of our signal. We can usually get a measurement, but uh, they're more challenging. And we can measure anything from a mirror smooth ultra finished blade all the way up to rough rubber, uh, cast iron, things like that. And it's designed to measure anything from flat surfaces to turbine blade edges and into corners. So we have capability that Kramer will show you for flattening out uh, measurements so that you can uh, quantify the defects or features you're after uh, in a very simple way. So with that, that's kind of enough of a basic intro. Uh, I'll turn it over to Kramer to actually introduce the product live and uh, show you some measurements of defects, edge break, radius, and uh, other features. Again, chime in with questions at any point. And with that, uh, you're up, Kramer. All right. So I am uh, Kramer Lindell. I'm an applications engineer here at 40 Technology. And I'll show you guys my, uh, my setup here. I have the 40 InSpec here. Right now it's in the microscope stand. And I have an assortment of parts here. So if any of you have any uh, 
uh, request and what you want to see. Uh, when I take these measurements, uh, feel free to type those in and we can we can do those for you. So uh, like Eric was saying, this is uh, what's really special about this instrument is that it's handheld. Um, I can uh, take a part and uh, put it up to uh, the part and uh, to a defect and uh, take a measurement just like this uh, by clicking this, uh, this uh, measurement button right here. And uh, this uh, uh, focus aid is just a standoff that allows me to uh, put the instrument up at, a, at the right focal distance so I can put it anywhere here and it'll be at the right focal distance so I can just uh, take the measurement, put it down, and uh, click this uh, button and take a measurement. So right now we can just start off with a basic uh, measurement of uh, some uh, laser dots uh, on this uh, kind of a shiny sample here. Uh, and I can show you how I take a measurement just like this. I point and click, just like taking a, a picture with your camera. I'll go to the 4D software to show you what the uh, inspect is seeing. So I can, uh, I'll get rid of this to make it more clear. So this right here on the left is uh, our live video. This is what the camera itself is seeing. Right now it's uh, blurry and gray. If I were to get that into focus, you start to see the uh, image turns uh, clear and green. When the image is green, uh, green means go, uh, and you're good uh, to take a measurement. So I'll go ahead and take a, a measurement of uh, these dots here. Just by pointing and clicking, I take a measurement, and uh, here I have uh, my 3D measurement, my 3D surface map of uh, this area of uh, the metal uh, sample I've taken a measurement of. So what's happening here is each of these uh, dots is being analyzed simultaneously. Uh, I'll move this real fast. Uh, so each of these dots is uh, showing up as a defect in our feature analysis. There's a few ways to view a measurement. Right now we're viewing it in uh, the feature analysis page. So each of these uh, individual dots is being simultaneously analyzed. So everything in this field of view is being analyzed uh, so this specific dot that I've clicked on this feature um, is being being shown to be uh, about 5.6 thousandths uh, of an inch deep. And uh, you can switch back and forth between, and we have a mixed audience here, uh, between uh, uh, imperial and metric units. Um, so I can go switch this over to uh, microns if I wanted to. I'll see it in microns. And I can switch back to inches if I wanted to. Uh, so you can switch back and forth. Uh, to whatever your preferences are, and you could save uh, your preferences in a, in a user config, so it, it'll always be what you want it to be. So each of these uh, is being analyzed. All the statistics you want to know about each of these features uh, can be shown right here in this table. And this is our uh, basic defect analysis that is being used right now all, all over the world. Um, and you can save this table. Um, all these uh, statistics on each of these. Um, Features can be saved as a .csv file just by clicking the Save button right here. If you want to do something simpler and take a screenshot of your defect and your uh, feature analysis, you can take a one uh, one click screenshot, save it anywhere you want to save it to any directory, and uh, you can save a measurement itself uh, as a uh, .4D file, which allows it to be put into our um, software, our 4D software and reanalyzed um, with different cropping, different shape removals, settings. You also save as an OPD file, an XYZ point cloud, and a .csv file. So we can take a look at different measurements, uh, different ways to view the measurement that we've taken here. So we can look at the 3D measurement. This is what the uh, the measurement looks like in 3D. This is this, is this uh, surface. We've got uh, in a contour, which is a, uh, false heat map where uh, the bluer it is, the lower it is, and the redder it is, the higher it is. You also have a traces page um, where we can uh, look at an X and a Z trace. Uh, you can draw your own trace here if you want to, if you want to draw a trace across this uh, defect. I can also up the width of my trace itself to 10 pixels, and I can uh, uh, do uh, specific, highlight certain areas and do specific measurements. So I can see my peak to valley here. My delta Z is uh, about 5.9 thousandths. 
So there's multiple ways to view a measurement um, as you go through it. Um, and uh, I can do some other, um, I can show you uh, our shape removal here. So uh, as I took the measurements, I can uh, have a little bit of freedom here to move around. So there can be some tilt between uh, the instrument and the sample itself. So I can show you how our software manages that. Um, so if I go back to our my, my measurements here, I'm going to click none. So every measurement you take will be saved here in the queue for uh, up to 10. Uh, it's up to you, but it can be, uh, right now we have this set to 10 measurements will be saved as we go through. I can reanalyze a measurement taken here um, with different shape removals. So right now I would take that previous measurement on uh, with tilt removal. So any tilt I had with the inspect uh, relative to the sample, I removed that. So I'll recalculate that uh, with no shape removal just to show you guys what that looks like. So we calculated it and you can see that uh, I wasn't quite orthogonal to the surface. Um, this is a little higher here on this side, uh, a little a little redder. This is a little lower. So we removed that tilt um, uh, by, with, with the shape removal here. So if I were to go to feature analysis, uh, my features aren't going, going to uh, stand out as clearly. Um, and when I remove that tilt, uh, they are able to stand out a little better. We also have uh, shape removals that remove the shape of parts, um, the shape of the part themselves without removing the shape of the defect. And I could show you an example of a part that uh, would need that. Uh, so we have a, a blade here that has some curvature to it. You guys can see that. Some curvature to that blade and on it, there is a uh, defect I have circled here, uh, right there. I could take a measurement of this defect uh, on this curved surface, uh, just like this, the same way I uh, took a measurement on the other one. Uh, I can put up to this surface, click this button, and I take a measurement. And uh, you can see that we have this blue LED uh, right here, so you don't have to worry about uh, any laser safety uh, options or uh, concerns. Uh, the blue LED uses the polarized structured light to create a surface map of any uh, surface you're looking at. So the thing that this light reflects off of, the camera picks up, and we're able to create that 3D surface map um, of the part. So I can take a measurement. I'll go back to my uh, my 4D software, go to my live video. So this is what my camera is seeing. And I want that uh, to be all green, like so. I'll go and take a measurement of that. And uh, I'll, go to, I'll go to 3D. So here, we are using uh, no shape removal. I'll go ahead and uh, go to tilt. So I'll remove the tilt that I had, uh, the instrument relative to the part. And I'll recalculate that surface. And so now you can see the shape of the part. You can see here uh, the curve of that blade. And then here's the defect. Uh, and if I put that into feature analysis, uh, you're going to see this entire curve of the part at, come up as a feature, uh, but we want to focus on this uh, defect itself relative to the part. So we can do a variable shape removal here. And that's going to remove the uh, curvature of the part uh, relative uh, and not remove the uh, shape of the defect. So now we have uh, the defect here uh, nice and clear. Uh, in, that's able to be entered into our uh, feature analysis. Uh, and you can see the the, high, the depth of it is uh, about nine thousandths of an inch. And we can look at that in a, the 3D to get a nice uh, nice view of it, the 3D view. So here, the part is flat now. The defect is still there. Has, the shape of the defect has not been removed com compared to the uh, just moving tilt. You can see the shape of that part and the shape of the defect. And here we flatten it out to allow our feature analysis to uh, uh, analyze it. <clears throat> yes, sir. Yeah, this is a good example, too. Um, if uh, you notice, folks, there's a, it's a little bit redder around the defect. And so we can actually look, and that's because it's an impact. Uh, it's damage from impact. And so it's displaced material up. So in the same measurement, we can actually look for both high 
and a little material using the the feature analysis. So, uh, you know, right right now there's just a tiny little bit of high material in the left at that threshold. But yeah, if you bring that down, <clears throat> yeah, and these uh, these specifications we have here for uh, our feature analysis are adjustable, so you can adjust them to your specs. So I just lowered this this threshold. Now uh, a lot more of this uh, this raised uh, material from the impact uh, is showing up as a defect. And you can so save simultaneously. A, yeah, you can get uh, you know for uh, for damage, you can get both things, and that's really useful, particularly you know if you're inspecting welds or, or other things as well. They can have a lot of structure. Yeah, so you can get depths and heights simultaneously. And if you want to set a, if you were wondering what that is relative to, um, right now we're just using average because it's a relatively simple um, part, not a whole lot of geometry to it. But if you wanted to set a, a zero points, you can go ahead and use a reference mask. So if I wanted this uh, flat area to be uh, my reference, I can just highlight this area. And now everything, um, uh, all the heights and all the depths uh, will be relative to this area. So if I wanted to do that, uh, have a reference mask on, it's highlighted blue now, can recalculate that surface, and now all of the uh, heights and the depths will be relative to the area I selected. So you can choose um, what these depths and these heights are based off of. Uh, hi, Kramer. Mask. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Sorry to interrupt, but we do have a question on uh, a, a hand up, basically. Ah, he's suggesting a part that he would like to see inspected. Um, okay. So let me uh, let me get that information. I'll get back to you. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, Kramer. Um, yeah. Scott would like to see inspection on the edge of the root form serrations of the RB211 blade, the shrouded blade. All right. This uh, is that uh, this one right here. Uh, where's the? I'm not sure. I I'm not sure what the which part that would be. Uh, no, the one that is left there. Yes. This one That's right here. He says. Yeah. Okay. He wants the root of it. Yeah, the yeah. root form serrations. Yeah. Uh, what, what exactly? Uh, which which area on the on the root of it? Uh, uh, Scott, I'm see. going to I'm going to unmute you and maybe yeah, you yeah. Can through this. <laughs> You can go uh, ahead direct, Scott. Scott, can you hear us? I you can, Kramer. Sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, it's the the one blade that's left almost uh, directly beside. That's the one there. Yeah. This one here. Yes, please. I got it. Okay. I'm interested in the yeah. um, the root form area. Okay, that makes. I don't know sense. if there's if there's any indications there, but um, either on the um, on the edge and just understanding kind of measurements on the edge with like a very complicated uh, surface. Okay, so you just want the just these uh, ridges right here, the serrations. Uh, more so right on the edge, yeah. Um, so um, the serrations go along, and then there's a, a flat surface at the end of the blade there. Okay. And just to look at if there was a dent on the edge, I don't know if there's any so marks on that. Like part. Uh, this area right here on this this edge you're referring to. Yeah, your camera oh, went out of focus a bit, Kramer. Oh, okay, sorry. I'm going to try to focus that in. Okay. Maybe I'll get in the focus a little bit. Yeah, sorry about that. There we go. Okay. Nice. Okay. So uh, is it that this, this area? Yeah, exactly right there. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll go ahead and uh, my live video here. Yeah, I don't know that we're going to have any uh, D 
defects to show you there, but uh, we can certainly show you the measurement. So that's the edge of it. So go and take a measurement of that. And then uh, this is what we're seeing there. Is that what you're looking for? And then you're going to want to uh, just go to tilt removal. Yeah. Oops, I have a reference mask on there. So this is the 3D data we get from looking at this area of, on, on the edge of, this, of the serrations. And where you see the data kind of missing, you know, that's areas where it's exceeded the two and a half millimeter depth range of the inspec. And so for something like this, if you needed to get the entire range, um, one, you could maybe angle it to get uh, to get better. But then the other thing you can do is the inspec XL, again, has a, a nine millimeter range or about uh, uh, three tenths of an inch. And so, Let's see if we can analyze. So we can analyze that chamfer here. This is a little bit of a chamfered edge. We can analyze along here if you wanted to. But yeah, it doesn't appear there's any actual, you know, damage to that part. Yeah, of I'm not seeing any uh, any defects on this edge. Uh, Kramer, another question. Yeah. I think referring back to that that ding, that pit measurement that you had earlier. Yep. I'll pull that up. Here we go. Yeah, the question was, uh, if I want to get the distance from the edge to the center of the damage, can I see that? Yeah, sorry. One second. So that, you know, you, you can get some of that information a couple ways. One from the feature analysis actually tells you the diameter as well as the, um, or, well, the X and Y length of the defect. So you can see that there. Um, so it's about 0.046 inches in length. And then also Kramer also uh, with the 2D cursors, you can do that more manually. Yes, yeah, so this is where traces becomes a, a powerful tool. So if you come and highlight uh, this area, you can see from from this left side uh, uh, of the field of view, you can see it's uh, about uh, sixty-seven thousandths, uh, sixty-eight thousandths of an inch from this left side uh, at, the, at this point on the defect. So this this is the uh, distance that we're highlighting uh, right here. This this green area. Uh, corresponds to this green area that we've highlighted. This is about where the defect begins. Um, if I want to uh, do it from the, where the raised area begins, about right here. Um, that's how I would measure from. Uh, well, from I, I think he's wanting upside. kind of the diameter or he wants the, diameter? the diameter or the radius of the defect itself. So okay, from so the edge the... to the deepest point. Yeah. Or... Yeah. So if I want to. Measure the width of this in traces. Uh, I can get the width right here, about 50, 50 thousandths, and then the the peak to valley in, in traces. It was it's going to be from the highest to the uh, deepest point. Uh, there'll be a difference on that. It's about uh, 10 thousandths deep here along this trace. All right. All right. So uh, maybe another, you know, as long as we're measuring difficult geometries, we could uh, show a blade edge, edge measurement of a nick and uh, kind of how the the focus aid can be changed. And then we can move on to uh, yeah. some edge break and radius. So this uh, focus aid, I've been adjusting up and down. Uh, 
uh, to get to the right focus, so just like this. You press this button and it slides in and out. And I can remove this and uh, change it out for a different uh, focus aid. So I'm going to use a, uh, a V-Groove uh, focus aid here. Uh, this allows me to uh, put it up to a blade edge. Uh, so I'm going to use these, this, this, uh, these blades right here. And I can ride along this uh, blade edge um, with the inspec. Uh, so I can use this, as, use this as a focus aid. I can slide this right in here, get to the right focus point, and just uh, uh, ride the inspec along this edge and uh, take uh, measurements of defects on this on this blade. So go ahead and go back to the uh, 40 software. Go ahead and move this all right all right so i have a defect right here and i want that defect to be uh, green in focus tilt removed all right now go ahead and uh Take a measurement of that. And now on a, on a fine geometry like this, I'll go ahead and uh, go back to my measurements uh, and I crop this down. I want to see like this area of interest. I can crop that, recalculate the surface, and uh, focus on uh, this area. I can draw a trace uh, along this. Uh, right here, and then I could do the same thing I was doing earlier, where I uh, can get the uh, width of it and the depth uh, along this blade edge. So I can I can say this defect is about uh, about 34.8 thousandths, um, and uh, the peak to valley here is about uh, 23 thousandths, uh, from the highest point to the lowest point of this defect along this blade edge here. So that's one of our different uh, uh, focus aids uh, that slides in and out of here. We also have um, what we saw, saw earlier in the slideshow, a, uh, a fold mirror. It can be uh, slid right into here, just like those aids uh, were, put in like that. This allows me to get in between um, the blades or any other tight spaces that you may uh, be trying to get into, and take measurements that are uh, not within the line of sight of the inspect. You can see uh, the LED on the uh, table there uh, being uh, folded at a, a right angle. Go ahead and adjust that a little bit. I could take a measurement uh, if there was a defect somewhere along here. Take a measurement of that defect inside the hard to reach space. So there's some different uh, accessories. Uh, that can go into uh, the inspec. Go and switch back to my painter focus aid, and then we can take uh, some uh, edge break measurements. Unless anyone else has any uh, requests about defect inspection uh, currently. So for edge break, we had a uh, edge break standard made for us uh, because one did not exist uh, on the market. Uh, so we designed this uh, standard. I could show you a little bit of a, a better picture in the presentation we have here. I can go to uh, the edge break standard here. And this is the edge break standard we have. So uh, there's a couple ways to break an edge um, of a sharp corner on any machined uh, uh, part. You can round off the edge like on this side here. On edge break standard, this corner is rounded off, so it's no longer sharp. And uh, you can also make a chamfer, which is a, just machining a flat uh, edge or a flat uh, plane into the edge uh, to give you two angles that are uh, obtuse instead of one sharp angle. So I can take some uh, chamfer measurements first, just like uh, this is being shown. Uh, the best way to do that is uh, take a measurement perpendicular to this chamfer face, 
so you can get data on all three uh, sides of this chamfer and uh, our software can analyze uh, the 3D data and allow you to make accurate uh, chamfer measurements. So I'll go ahead and show you how I will take some chamfer measurements on this EdgeBake standard. So I'm just gonna put this uh, DN spec up like this at a 45 degree angle. I'll just click this button right here and uh, take a measurement, go to my software here, go back to live video, and I get in focus like that. Once I'm green, green means go. All right, nice and focus there. I'll do and take a measurement. I'm not to worry too much about how uh, perpendicular I am to the uh, to the surface uh, because we're using 3D data. Um, our software can analyze it with uh, as much as 45 degree um, rotation here. So here we have, you can see in our 3D data, we have a nice uh, chamfer shape with three planes. I could put that into my chamfer analysis. Um, what the software is going to do here is identify all the data points that are on this uh, left plane, all data points that belong to this right plane, and I fit all data points to this chamfer face. It's going to reconstruct um, the chamfer and the edge itself. Uh, tell me, uh, remove any tilt that I had, any uh, tilt that I had, you can see the tilt my inspect had to the relative to the part there. Remove all the tilt and give me um, my accurate uh, chamfer measurements. So this the standard is certified to a left length right here of uh, 40 thousandths, so we're about right there, and right length of 40 thousandths. And our chamfer length is about what we expect right there. And we can, I can show you all these parameters. It's easier to understand if uh, we take a look at a, uh, a diagram here. So we have our chamfer length uh, right here. Our right length is the length of material that has been removed uh, from the edge itself, the same as the left length. What our software is doing is identifying this plane and this plane and uh, uh, identifying the point that where they would intersect and giving you this length, this length, reconstructing all the material that is no longer there and giving the lengths of the material that uh, would theoretically be there. So that is everything the, uh, the software is doing and it's uh, giving you all these parameters. And each of these uh, can be pass fail. So if Say, for instance, we wanted to have this uh, minimum be uh, 0.06 inches. We can ha uh, This would be flagged as red, as failing. Or if we wanted it to be uh, 0.05 to you know, 0.06, if we could fall within our uh, specifications, and it will be flagged as green, as passing. And that's true for each one of these. You can uh, set your specs for a specific specific part. You can save um, a, a specific uh, user setting, a user config for that specific part. And then you can uh, pull that down in here. If I wanted uh, this specific chamfer, click that. And I can have uh, my settings right here. So that is a, a chamfer measurement. Um, We can go ahead and do a, a rounded edge, the other type of uh, uh, edge break. I can flip this uh, standard around to look at the uh, chamfer or the uh, the rounded edge. And to take that measurement, it's the, the, very similar to the chamfer measurements. I just take a measurement at a 45 degree angle to get this uh, left plane, this right plane, and the rounded edge uh, in my field of view. I'll go back to my uh, live video. I'm in focus there. Go ahead and take a measurement. All right, so we have uh, our uh, our right plane here, our left plane, and they're both adjacent to this rounded area. So what our software is doing is picking out the data points, fitting them to this right plane, same for the left plane, it's identifying where those planes stop and where this rounded area in the middle begins. And then we fit a uh, best fit circle uh, to the area in the middle. So we expect uh, uh, a race about 40 thousandths here and 
And, you can, and it's easier to see uh, which of these callouts are uh, showing with this diagram, kind of similar to the uh, chamfer measurements. Uh, it's identified, uh, it's a measuring material that is no longer there. This right length and this left length, this material has been removed, fitting a best fit circle uh, to the curved area and giving that edge break radius, as well as these different inner surface angles and arc angles in between. And these are all in the manual if you ever need to refer back to these uh, 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 geometries to identify what each of these are uh, calling out. And you can set the same specs as you, you can in the chamfer. And, uh, really the power of this is that uh, alignment doesn't necessarily matter too much. Um, I can have this at a 45 degree angle and still get accurate measurements. Whereas if I was doing a 2D trace, uh, I would be uh, separate to cosine error and uh, measure a radius or a uh, chamfer length is artificially larger than it is. And this, uh, with a 3D data over taking over a large area, I don't have to worry about that with tilt being removed and uh, any any uh, data flyers being removed as well. Hey, Kramer, not that yeah. we want to uh, bore people with too many slides, but uh, since you mentioned kind of the performance of the three-dimensional edge break, uh, I know you've done a lot of studies on that. Could you pull up some of the gauge results and uh, some of the studies just so people get a feel for the uh, accuracy and uh, reproducibility of the system? Yeah, I could pull up this uh, gauge r and &R study we did. We used, uh, obviously, three different uh, uh, operators um, to measure some different chamfers and uh, radii. And uh, you see there, we were our gauge r and &R, uh, uh, we were within uh, about 3%, and uh, sometimes as low as uh, less than 1%. And uh, we found that these, uh, these measurements are very accurate, and uh, this uh, Analysis software has been very robust, uh, whether it be with uh, consistent re reproducibility and repeatability, and uh, even when we're introducing uh, angles and uh, tilt to the measurements. And we have some correlation studies as well, right? Yes, we do. Here's one with counter sinkholes. Um, we're looking at uh, uh, our, our inspect uh, measurements versus uh, stylus values. You can see our uh, R squared values are almost uh, about 99.9 uh, .9 and uh, and higher. We can look at uh, our uh, different um, different standards here. And so yeah, so here the, we were yeah. actually looking. Um, at the, the results of the inspect against the optical comparator used by uh, the person uh, constructing the standards. And, uh, you know, again, high linearity, um, very low offsets uh, between the techniques. But the major uh, difference being that uh, for us to do the measurements, it's, you know, a second or two per location, whereas for the stylus, in order to get them properly aligned, and even for the optical comparator, you know, the results take considerably longer, and uh, you know you have to be moving parts, you know, to another machine. Now the standard's easy to put on an optical comparator, but obviously something like one of the aviation shafts or a countersunk hole or something, you would have to cross section it or replicate it in in order to do a, a comparator type technique. I can go ahead and take a a measurement on a. Uh chamfered hole on a, on a shaft uh, on, on this part right here to show you how easy alignment is for us. We don't have to worry about um, any of those cosine error, uh, errors that are, the satellite are subject to. So I can just uh, get, as long as I have this in focus, I can uh, take an accurate chamfer measurement. So I'm just going to put this up to the part like this. I go back to my 4D software, go back to my live video. And I can take a measurement, once I get this in focus, of this uh, chamfered hole, like that. 
And uh, with this, I'll go ahead and uh, crop a narrative interest here to here. And here I'll get that nice uh, nice chamfer shape. I fill into the chamfer analysis. And I can get a, a chamfer length of this, uh, this uh, one of these chamfered holes on this uh, diagonal surface. Pretty easy, pretty quick. And uh, I get my analysis right here. Kramer, if I, I could interrupt, I would love to ask our audience a question, uh, kind of a informal poll. Um, if you would uh, let us know in the uh, in the question box how it is that you measure your chamfers and edge break now, and uh, do you feel that that's accurate enough, and is it quick enough for your process? Uh, We'd just like to to have a feel for how how people are handling that. You can just type your answer into the question box. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Edgar. That's actually a great a great question because you know we've gotten feedback from all over. Some people you know, really struggle, and uh, Kramer will show you an automotive part uh, that we uh, can measure using our robot in a matter of a couple minutes. It you know was taking them. Um, you know, more more than a day to measure all the the various callouts. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to uh, get more information because this is a, a newer application for the inspec and so, something that uh, you know we're we're still learning more about uh, the tools that are out there and how people are using them. Yeah, but, one thing we've learned <clears throat> with uh, <clears throat> edge break measurements is uh, part drawings are uh, can have dozens of edge break call out. So automation like uh, you see on the screen here is uh, helps reduce the time significantly. Uh, these can be tedious measurements and uh, th uh, with uh, typical uh, measurement types and using automation uh, really speeds up the process here. All right, so yeah, and then uh, maybe we want to show them a radius measurement too, or yeah, we can do a. That's the last uh, part of our <clears throat> edge break software. We can go through that. Uh, our three to race of curvature. Uh, I'll I'll pull out my uh, radius standard here. All right, and yeah, as Kramer does that, you know, again, you know, the what we're trying to. Uh, to demonstrate and, and uh, show you all is that, you know, our, our goal here was, you know, make everything as, as quick as possible. If you can do various measurements in the matter of minutes uh, and, and get the results automatically, you know, we've really uh, had customers tell us that it's saving them thousands of dollars a day, uh, sometimes even more, uh, depending on the part, just because they're able to measure right up to the specification line with certainty of the results, and uh, their operators are able to do it um, in any part of their facility. Uh, Kramer, we have a pretty uh, pretty quick question. Yeah. Uh, what is the maximum number of measurements you're able to save in the software? Previously, you had mentioned that you had it set at 10 measurements. Yeah, right now, we have it, uh, I believe, at 10. <clears throat> we used to have it at 30, but we can we could change that uh, as needed. But you can save as many. Um, I go back and save this as many as you know your PC will allow, or your hard drive or external drive. I can save as many of these as I go, as I want. So I can save this measurement and and keep going, saving each one individually. But in the stack here, we just these aren't saved to your computer, but they'll be saved in the software for. Uh, until they get kicked out. So there's sort of a working area save, and then there's also the data file saved to the server? Yeah, so right now our standard or our default is to have 10 saved down here. Um, and you can select these and save, uh, uh, save any of these as uh, to any directory you want. You can save it to a hard drive, to a, a, uh, to, you know, a flash drive, and save as many as you want. 
Yeah, and Brennan, we can actually increase that probably to about 20 measurements, but as each single measurement has more than 4 million or right around 4 million data points, uh, we keep it at 10 as standard uh, just so that we, we aren't consuming too much of the computer's memory uh, mm -hmm. having that available. So I'll go ahead and show the last part of the Edge Break software package is a uh, race of curvature. So I just took a simple measurement of a cylinder. I can throw this into the 3D race of curvature and it's gonna um, do the same, kind of the same thing we did with a rounded edge. We're identifying the rounded part of the cylinder and uh, fitting the best fit circle uh, to the cylinder. Uh, give me a, uh, a uh, race of curvature right here. 0.491 uh, inches, and that, that, that's, it, it's a pretty simple process, and uh, it removes kind of like uh, the chamfer and the rounded edge, uh, removes any uh, tilt errors that you may have. And similar to that, uh, if, if you didn't have the edge break package, you can uh, use the uh, traces page. Uh, to highlight the area of interest, and it'll give you a, a radius of curvature here. You just have to be careful not to uh, to be perpendicular to the axis of rotation. If I was a little skewed like that, it's going to give me a artificially large uh, radius, and now I'm getting 0.531 instead because I was I was not perpendicular to uh, that axis of rotation or curvature. So I've taken about a measurement on nearly every part here. Um, if you guys have any questions uh, or any requests, um, please let me know and uh, we can get that done for you. Yeah, one thing Kramer, just as long as you uh, have all the stuff around there, um, yeah. you know, we've been measuring mostly all on metal. Do you just maybe want to show a quick measurement say on the, uh, the plastic inspect holder or the table or some other materials, you know, just uh, give people a yeah, feel yeah, for how the system adjusts. I have a little 3D printed part here. Um, it's a, a dark surface that we can we can measure. We've been measuring some shiny metal. We can go to a dark 3D printed surface and uh, go to the, take a measurement basically the same way. Uh, putting the focal, focal aid up to that and uh, taking the measurements to the live video and we have an auto brightness uh, feature that's very useful we haven't touched on I don't think uh, it allows me to switch back uh, from metal to dark uh, to dark uh, samples pretty quickly it gets me to the correct brightness so I'll go ahead and take a, uh, a measurement of this There we go. All right. Go ahead and Take a look at that in 3D. I'm removing here. Remove and then, uh, yeah, while you do that, we do have another question about uh, chamfer measurements, asking whether we can measure uh, chamfers in the face groove machined in a CNC lathe. Uh, so, yeah, as long as we have optical access, you know, either directly or I don't know that we actually showed you the fold mirrors in use yet. But again, we have a uh, fold mirror capability. Uh, you know, we should be able to uh, to measure uh, chamfers in you know almost any situation. The system's fairly small in diameter, and uh, with the fold mirrors, we can get into spaces as small as a half inch hole uh, in order to uh, take measurements. And so, certainly, if you uh, if you want to send us further details about the specific geometry, we're, we're happy to do that. 
uh, take a look and and confirm. We could even, you know, get a 3D model and make sure we have access. But that's not typically been a problem. Because yeah, here on the uh, 3D printed part, we were able to measure uh, layer heights and uh, distances. Yeah, so on additive manufacturing, people will use this sometimes to look for voids in the outer surface or the most recent layer, uh, you know, other imperfections. And as you see, you, know, you get some pretty complex uh, complex layer geometry, uh, depending on what you're depositing. So, guys, could I ask you to... Uh, maybe restate because we've been looking at a lot of of high accuracy high precision measurements um, how how does that translate to value a, uh, in the shop floor how does the analysis feature benefit uh, people who are trying to pass or fail parts sure I'll, I'll take that on so what we were finding you know is most inspectors particularly on high dollar components and in certain areas such as uh, aviation uh, they're always going to err on the side of caution. And tolerances on parts are getting nothing but tighter. So it used to be that tolerances were maybe, uh, you know, ten thousandths or more. They're going uh, be below five thousandths in a lot of cases. And, uh, and inspectors just either with their fingernail or with their eyes or even with... Uh, you know, uh, cross-sectioning, they're just, uh, if they're not certain, and they're typically not to that kind of level, um, they're going to err on the side of, well, let's let's make it right. Let's uh, let's rework that. Uh, concurrently, uh, and so that that's a big part of it, is having something that's quantified, that has been validated in various uh, shops, and we have gauge data that we can share as well, gives the inspector confidence that, if his uh, tolerance is six thou and we measure it at four thou, um, that he's perfectly fine saying that's a good part and uh, and moving it on through the chain. Additionally, we have found people have a lot of value just by having a digital record of what they measure. So a lot of times when you know almost any machine component is going to be shipped, it's going to get damaged in some way or another. It's gonna have some scratch or nick or other other imperfection via handling or something. And so when it arrives at the end customer, uh, we've had a lot of uh, our customers say they would reject things. And without a digital record that, yeah, the original manufacturer saw the defect, measured the defect and proved that it was non-functional or you know merely cosmetic and within spec, um, the original manufacturer would have to accept that material back. And so we actually have uh, one of our biggest customers has said that uh, they tell their vendor now often when they're asked about the severity of a given feature, oh, we 4D'd it. And uh, the, the cu their customer now says, oh, okay, we trust that and they'll accept the part. So that's the other way that people are saving a lot of time and money and and scrap. So it's both internally making sure they don't rework it unnecessarily. And then even after shipment, making sure things aren't returned. So those are the two primary uh, mechanisms by, by which it uh, saves, uh, saves parts. And then the other thing is, you know, as Kramer showed earlier, the fact that we can measure multiple defects within the field of view, or if you have a scratch, we'll automatically find the deepest part of the scratch. Again, that saves a lot of time. You're not doing multiple stylus measurements. You're not inspecting every single pit one at a time. You can get tens or hundreds of features simultaneously and get good results. Yeah, if I'm looking at this, these defects, if these were corrosion pits, I can uh, imagine if I was doing each one of these individually, uh, it would take a, take a lot of time. And here, everything in the field of view is being uh, analyzed simultaneously. 
So, uh, guys, yeah. I have a, another question uh, from Scott. It's regarding the uh, the turbine blade. Can you measure cooling hole shapes on the cooled turbine blade? He says he's not sure if these are all through holes or if there are shapes. Question mark. So we can measure the cooling hole geometry in terms of there's kind of a leading groove uh, downwards. What we can't measure is there's a vertical portion in which the hole is actually drilled. And generally, we you can't get light into that vertical portion. But uh, certainly, we've had people look at the angle of the cooling channel, uh, the volume of the cooling channel. So all of that is quantifiable. And actually, if you export the 3D CAD data or you know, export our XYZ point cloud, you can do a CAD comparison, and people have done so. Um, but, uh, but there is that one little perfectly vertical section of the cooling holes that uh, I, I know from experience we just can't uh, get access to. We also have a question about, you know, is the product available uh, in Europe? Yeah, we actually have excellent uh, distributors in that are, you know, fully trained on the product in uh, Germany, France, and uh, the UK. We've Italy. also sold systems into Poland, Hungary, Lithuania, Italy, Spain, um, and other places. So uh, we're quite used to supporting uh, Europe and uh, and and we can put you in touch with a local rep, uh, you know, as appropriate. Um, and then one other question has come in about uh, if you have tiny dust particles, uh, how can you tell them apart? If they're tiny, then you know our lateral resolution is around uh, seven microns or two tenths of a thou depending on if you're metric or English. Um, if they're much smaller, you know, if they're on that order, we won't see them at all. If you have a piece of dirt or something, yeah, we would measure that likely as high material. Uh, typically, we don't recommend and people don't clean the parts. Uh, but if there's a lot of debris on them, you might blow it off briefly with air because we are doing a surface measurement. And we can't tell whether... You know, it's uh, part of the actual part surface or something deposited on top of the part. So if that matters, uh, you can try blowing it off. Uh, the other thing you can do is if you know that that's kind of not uh, part of the component, you can use that reference mask that Kramer was using and basically make sure that you're not considering that as part of your uh, as part of your area. Oh, and then uh, we're running out of time, and I don't want to keep folks, but we'll do, uh, we have one more question on uh, stitching, and I guess you guys see that up at the, the top of our field of view. So that's actually something that's uh, still in development for us. It's uh, not actually offered except for uh, a few people to be trying out in the world. One of the challenges with a, with a handheld surface gauge is we have all uh, six degrees of freedom from measurement to measurement. So we can translate, we can rotate, we can uh, pitch and yaw. And so unless you have features like the dots you see in Kramer's current measurement, uh, we don't know how to actually put the data together. So if you're using the robot, that's fairly straightforward. Uh, when we save a measurement with the robot, it actually saves the coordinate. Um, of the instrument for each measurement. Uh, but in handheld, uh, right now, stitching is kind of limited to if we have a scratch that extends from one field of view to the next, you can actually measure both fields of view and there's enough of a feature there that we can put it together. But we don't actually stitch together like a large component that is fundamentally featureless. Uh, just again, we don't know how the system is oriented. And uh, and also, personally, I always recommend against stitching unless absolutely necessary, just because it makes data analysis very difficult. With 4 million points per field of view, 
it doesn't take too many stitch data sets before you start overwhelming even modern computers in terms of memory. All right. Well, if there's no further questions, uh, thanks a lot, Kramer. As usual, you did you know, a great job uh, you know, demonstrating the capabilities of the system and Edgar for uh, moderating here. Thank you all for attending. Feel free to uh, email us with uh, questions. Um, you know, and uh, we're happy to respond and uh, also put you in touch with uh, lo local folks that can do uh, demos or we can bring parts in house. As you see, measurements are super quick, so uh, we never we never hesitate but to say yes if people want us to uh, show us measurements on their parts.